this lamp and I'm going to show you today how to do some black and white processing in Capture One. I'm using Capture One Pro version 8.1. This is the full version, not the Sony version. I am a Sony shooter, but uh, I am using the full version because I have multiple cameras. The Sony version, Capture One Express, is free. That's great news. And, um, and for a, a wonderful deal, you can get the Express for $30 more. Uh, this was informed by my uh, contact over at Sony. Uh, and they made this arrangement or this uh, partnership with Capture One, which is uh, a great deal for those who are in Sony. So for Nikon and Canon users, it's a little too bad, but you know, this is a, definitely uh, an incentive to be over in Sony as well. Anyhow, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, before I get started here, just briefly on some things that I usually consider when I'm doing black and white photography. So some of the things I start to do is I select images with colors that are broad within a spectrum. Uh, meaning that, you know, when you look at this image back here, that all the, the blue in the background is, is, is a nice big broad color, plus the green in the bottom is a big broad color. I like to make subjects that really pop in a scene, so I try to choose subjects that, you know, have some contrast with each other. So, you know, like reds and greens are, are good contrasting colors, while, you know, you, you know, purples and yellows, those are those are all going to be, you know, things that you find on the opposite side of a color wheel are going to be great. You can make these adjustments, obviously, when you go into uh, into Capture One to, to make those uh, uh, slight adjustments, but you know, the, it, it, varying scenes can have varying different types of uh, things in them. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, it, it can be a little bit of a hit and miss. Uh, a lot of it's based on experience for the, the user that comes up with some of these things. In the film world, we photographers years ago used to use a lot of different types of films that had different types of uh, spectral responses to different parts of, of, of light. Um, or we use filters. So... If you ever go into an old camera store and you find all these like blue, red, and yellow filters, those all have different things that they're used to try to get the best effect out of uh, black and white photography. I try to, you know, look for things that are blue, and blue is one of those things that are, that's great because you can adjust it so that it can be really dark. Um, reds, on the other hand, when you're trying to use a red filter or anything like that, you can use that to try to adjust, uh, especially skin tones. Skins have a lot of reds, yellows, and and oranges that you can adjust and it just really brightens up the skins make them makes them look a little uh, uh, more livelier uh, gets rid of blemishes without the need of using Photoshop uh, or, or a cloning stamp or anything like that so the, those, those are some of the choices that you know you kind of try to make when you're when you're trying to make it do a black and white uh, uh, setup here so before we get started here I just want to sort of cover some of the things that I, I usually start off when I'm when I'm teaching or when I'm doing workshops I always start with a default palette, and so I try to always start with uh, opening up an application that looks very similar to what you might start off with. So by default, I always go up to the window, um, found at the very top of, uh, I'm using a Mac here, so uh, Windows, it should be something similar, but up there, look for the thing that's called Window, and go down to Workspace. Under Workspace, you'll find a default. Now, my setup here might be a little bit different here, I'm going to go to, um, let's see what we got here, I go to default there we go so that's what the default setting looks like you want to switch over to that uh, this is uh, always a good way to st a good starting base uh, to go from now we're gonna go into presets capture one actually has a really good black and white preset that uh, that's a pretty good job but we're gonna go into it and we're gonna change it around and uh, we're gonna we're gonna apply a couple things that uh, I feel that are, is a better workflow but uh, um, so let's get started on that so back again under window You'll look under workspace and you'll see under there that there is something called black and white editing. Now, I actually quite like what they've done here in Capture One. And you can see as it switches over to the, the black and white settings, you can see that they've actually put together a, a good set of different options that uh, someone who's going to do black and white editing are going to choose from. Now, there's a few options I feel that are missing in there or it's kind of out of order. I've adopted a, uh, my Lightroom techniques and brought them into Capture One that, that works uh, with my workflow and works uh, the way that I, li I think that black and white is processing is, should be done. But um, every, everyone 
has a different individual taste and, and can certainly, and that's the nice thing about Capture One is that you can reconfigure it uh, to, to your, um, to the way that you like to work. So I have here two images. Uh, they're actually the same image, um, just so that I can have it before and after. I always like to start off with, uh, uh, you know, a couple of variants in there. So let's just talk a little bit about the menus in here. Um, before we get started, I want to start to configure this. So I'm just going to close down some of these windows here, uh, just so that you can see the, a little more space in here. And uh, what I'm going to do, whoops. You'll find that sometimes these things are a little finicky at times. So what I, I'm going to start off here is under this area, you'll see that there is four icons and that's where you'll you'll it automatically when you switches over to the pre presets you'll automatically go to that fourth icon uh, which is going to be your black and white and you can see all the various presets that that they sort of chosen that they think are uh, important to black and white editors now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to right click here i'm going to add and you can see the add tool here and i'm going to add the base characteristics the base characteristics will, will show up here in the bottom and you can just click it to cl uh, collapse it and then you just click it again to click on top of it and just drag it up to the area that you want. Now I actually like to have my presets up there because I actually have my own set of presets. So I'm just going to put them underneath here. I'll just collapse that down. And I'm going to add another one in here. And I'm going to add high dynamic range. High dynamic range is going to be really handy when we're, we're trying to recover some, some of the uh, shadow and highlights. So again, I'm going to collapse that down. And once you do that, go back up to Window and just hit your Save Workspace. I'm just going to call it My Own Black White Set. Then it's good to have your own presets and your your own workspace. Uh, you can always go back and forth, and uh, that that's the beauty of. Uh, using Capture One is it's got so much flexibility that you can actually configure it so much that mm, someone else wouldn't be able to recognize how to use it, which is why I, I mentioned at the beginning going to the default. Let's save there. All right, so let's get started here. So first thing I generally like to do when I'm, when I'm starting with working in a panel here. So I created, I mentioned that I create some variants here. So here I'm starting with an image that's a DNG file that's been converted, uh, imported and converted in Lightroom. And I've once again re-imported into Capture One. Good thing about Capture One that it does support DNG files. So that's actually a really good good feature in it. Uh, you don't have to bring it in as a DNG file. You can bring in it as an ARW file. Um, it's complete, fully supported. The uh, uh, all the Sony files, uh, Nikon obviously, and, and and Canon files are supported within Capture One. Uh, of course, you'd have to have the full version if you're going to have multiple cameras. So, if you right click on here, you can set yourself up a new variant. I already have a variant in there, but that's just so you can go back and forth to see what your before and after is going to look like. So let's go to our second variant here, just so we can work on that. That'll be our working copy. I'm going to start with the base characteristics. So in the base char characteristics, you want to adjust the curves. Now, why you want to adjust the curves? Uh, you'll find there's a film setting and there's a linear response. So the, the ver various film settings are going to give us a little bit of control over our image in a, uh, in a, 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 a capture one kind of way. Um, I dare call it analog. It's not analog. It's it's more of a predictive way of making adjustments. Whereas a linear response is more kind of like an amplified response, very Lightroom like. That's what Lightroom, how Lightroom goes about adjusting its settings. Um, so it's 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 a little bit more logarithmic. Uh, it's a much more natural feeling way of making adjustments. I actually like using both either the extra shadow or the fi uh, the film standard. Uh, Today we're going to just go with extra shadow because it's a dark image, so we'll go extra shadow. And you can see the differences there. And I'll go back and forth between the before and the after so you can see how much that has changed. You can see that the tone has changed, the shadow has recovered down below. Actually, it's quite a well-balanced image in this way. So using the base characteristics to adjust that is actually a good thing to do in the beginning. The next thing I do is I adjust the high dynamic range. Now I don't go and adjust shadows. I adjust only the highlights because right in here I, I want to adjust this clipping that's happening in the clouds. Now 
just to, to mention, I also, when I, when I took this photograph, I exposed it specifically for uh, consideration for the highlights. In this case, the, uh, the sky and the clouds. I didn't want to expose uh, the lower section. Once you clip, uh, once you clip the, uh, the highlights, you can't recover them. So it's, it's actually pretty amazing what you can do and, and you can't do. I'll just show you what happens. So I'm gonna I'll bring my highlights up in here. I'll just move that slider over here and you can see right away just how much difference that it creates within that sky. Here's the before and the after. And just recovering just a little bit. That might be a little bit much. I might That might be a little bit heavy hand, so I'll just pull it back a little bit. But I'll show you what happens when you do the shadow slider. So the shadow slider also brings it up quite a bit. So some people, you know, you, you might have seen, uh, well, and it's very HDR-like um, to do that. And this actually might be very close to what it looked like to my eye. I generally keep shadow off. I'm gonna actually turn it up just a little bit. I'm not gonna turn it off completely. Um, I wanna deal with a couple of things in here, but uh, um, you can either turn it on and off because what, some of the things that we're gonna do a little later on is, is it, will make, it will actually make no difference whether or not we, we turned on shadow up or not. So there we go. Let's take a look at the before and after again. So that's the before and the after. So right away, just you know, a dramatic thing. So what we're trying to do is, uh, with black and white processing, I'm trying to simulate what the, the real high range that you get from black and white photography. That's what, that's some of the beauty of, of, of black and white film. Let's uh, collapse the high dynamic range. I'm gonna go right. So now that I've done that, I'm ready to make some adjustments. Oh, one of the things that I generally like to do as well is I, I like to reorder. I should reordered my, uh, my, 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 my my defaults here. I generally like to have my exposure before black and white, so I'll, I'll move that up ahead there. Just it just works a little bit better in my workflow because um, I like to have the black and white as my secondary thing. Everything else pretty much falls within the same category, I think. So I'll just I'll just zoom in here so you guys can see that a little bit better uh, of what what it is. So I, I start with base characteristics, high dynamic range, then I go to exposure, black and white's my next setting, levels and curves. I don't use the curves as much as as as, as some people do, but uh, both level and curves, uh, I try to just give it a little bit of a touch uh, when I need to, and then clarity, and then the rest is just really just kind of um, vignette and, and film grain is really just by your own kind of uh, personal preference. So now that I've done the high dynamic range portion, I'm gonna go into the exposure section. I don't touch exposure for the most part. If uh, uh, unless there are some exposure issues, I don't think there's much exposure issues in here, but I'm going to do something that most people are not used to doing. Most people, when they go to the contrast setting, is they slide the contrast up. They're, they're trying to make it either a little bit more punchier or dark or whatever. This is actually a rule. Uh, you know, I, I always tell my students in Lightroom and Photoshop to turn the contrast down. So what I'm doing is I'm actually flattening out uh, the image considerably. So there it is. Uh, before or uh, with the contrast that's before and this is after so it's, you can see that it's flattened out considerably so the next thing I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna just brighten up just the image just a tiny bit I just I think I feel the scene is a little bit yeah so we got a little bit now it's starting to flatten out that's or that whole scene is starting to really come out looking almost like my eye and I'm gonna the next thing I'm gonna do with this is to increase the saturation. So you can really crank up that saturation if you want, or you can just you know do a little lighter approach. It's not gonna matter because once we convert it to black and white, uh, the, the colors uh, are gonna be gone. But the saturation slider is actually still a very important part of, uh, of the whole process. You can leave it at sort of a, you know medium high right now at this part, and we'll come back to that. So now we're gonna go down to the black and white setting. So the color sensitivity is your color filters. So I'm gonna enable the black and white. You can see what's gonna happen. It's gonna basically look like a desaturated image. So, you know, here's what it would look like before, and here's what it looks like now. So it looks very flat. The sky looks kind of, you know, grayish. Everything looks gray. One of the things I want you to, uh, to notice is, look at this grass now. The grass looks extremely flat. And in fact, some of that is due to the fact that I was making some adjustments over here at the shadow. So I might want to actually 
adjust that so that it goes back down to almost nothing. So that's why I actually prefer that off. Um, that's helped a little bit. You can see that there's some, you know, when you look back at the original, you can see that there is some depth in there. We've lost some of that depth and we want to return some of that depth back. All right, so let's go to that color setting. So I'm gonna make some adjustments here in the red. You can move the red and red slide around. Watch the grass on the, right along that tree line there. You can see the grass changing color as I move that slider. I'm gonna move it, I usually just always start off maybe, you know, like, you know, 40 is a good number and you can see how much that grass has changed. Um, the yellow will also affect how the, the grass down below. So I want to bring up, I want to actually make it a little darker. And I also want to make the green a little darker too. So what's that, what that, what that has done now, I'm a little heavy handed there, but uh, you can see now that there is some depth. There's some little dark and light spots in there. Now the grass has, you know, it looks a little bit more livelier than the flat, flat, uh, the flat gray that it was before. So it's it's always a nice balance that you can do. Now we want to make some drama to the sky. So here I can move that, that slider for the cyan and the blue over and I'm going to get a nice dark sky. Now watch out, you have to be really careful about this because one of the things too about having an ultra wide lens is that you may end up with this really dark spot on your image. Now that's just the nature of ultra wide lenses and that's because it's a polarization. You got light coming in from all directions and scattering everywhere. It's a, it's it's just physics that you're, you're contending with and you can't really do much about that. You can try to make some, uh, you know, uh, make sure that you don't do too heavy of your adjustments and just, you know, make sure that it's, it's, it's sort of like a, a nice light bit balance between the two. There we go. So I'm going to just adjust the blues up a little bit and move the cyan a little bit. Magenta is not going to have a lot to do in this scene. There's no magenta in this. If I move the slide around, you can see that there's nothing around that's happening here. So really, you know, just applying a color sensitivity to the whole thing is going to give you um, a lot of depth and a lot of uh, drama. This image is pretty uh, dynamic already as is. I'm, I'm starting to be really pleased with what I'm getting here. Uh, a couple things I might do now, and I'm going to go to the levels just to adjust things. Now, when I brought back up the shadows but with some of the adjustments I did, flattening out the contrast, brightening up the scenes, now I've lost a little bit of the silhouette feel to it. I actually like my, when looking at the original, there's something nice about that silhouette, that tree, that lone tree that's there. But when I go to the black and white, I'm feeling that the sky, maybe the sky's a little bit too dark. I can certainly adjust that down just a touch there. But I want to bring back a little bit of that silhouette. So. You, when you go to your levels, you can you can select your black and your white point. So with my white point, I might select my white point and you know pick don't pick the hottest part of your scene, which is the whitest part of your scene, but pick something that's you know just a slightly off white. And oh, that's too much. So you can certainly and don't worry about whether or not you've gone too far because the nice thing about this dropper is that you can go back and you can see where the bottom of that dropper has selected where it feels that it needs to clip out. So you can always grab that and adjust that. Same thing with a black one. If you don't want to use the dropper, you can just grab the corner and move it in. So there we go. Oh, that's good. So now my tree is starting to look a little bit more punched out against that backdrop of the sky now. It's, it's kind of like, and I'm still maintaining a little bit of gray in the grass. So now I have a little bit of foreground, uh, midground, and background. And if you want to make your some adjustments to your midtones, you can adjust that from this middle slider, which is also known as your gamma. So as I do a little bit of a gamma adjustment here, I can choose where I want to be. I actually liked it pretty much right down the middle. That was actually pretty good. As I was saying, curves is one place that I probably don't touch that much anymore. In back in the days, uh, 20 years ago, when I used to work with uh, a lot of scanning and imaging, uh, the curves was one of the things that I used the most. And one of the things that a lot of uh, old uh, image editors will do is they'll they'll, they'll tow their uh, their curves. And this is a way to create a real high dy no, or not sorry, a, a real high contrast to your image. So. By towing it, you're, what you're doing is you're compressing the blacks or the shadows and the highlights. And it creates a really dynamic and high contrast looking image. So um, so it, it, it almost has a panachromatic look. If this is the look that you're looking for, this is one thing that you can do. You can use the curves to do that. I generally, in this case, I don't want to do that. I want to have a little bit more of a balanced scene. But this might be a look based on your personal preference that you can go for. So I'm just going to reset that and put it back to being flat. So I, I generally don't touch that um, 
it's uh, since there is no real levels adjustment in uh, Lightroom, you, you use the, the white and the black point specifically to adjust levels in there within that exposure setting uh, area, the, the base settings. And uh, in Capture One, it's a little bit more expanded. For those people who use Aperture, you might find this kind of a little bit more of a familiar way of doing things, of having a levels and, and, and curves separate. But you don't have to actually use both of them or touch both of them. So the last thing I was talking about was bringing up your contrast. So how do you bring up the contrast? Rather than using the contrast, which is a little bit more wide, well, it's a wider sort of uh, range of uh, contrast adjustment, micro contrast is done through clarity. So clarity gives me a couple options here. We've got natural, punch, neutral, and classic. Let me zoom in there a little bit so you guys can see that a bit better. There you go. So those are the choices. Now I'm, I'm going to choose punch. Um, classic is a little bit closer to what uh, Lightroom does for clarity, but I'm going to choose punch as my my method. And the nice thing about this is it, it you know both with clarity and structure uh, really great with trees and so forth. So I'm going to just adjust the clarity slider up a little bit, and you're going to see what's going to happen right, right immediately. You can see that it's brought to life the outside of uh, real high contrast parts where, where the sky and the clouds meet. You can see now the clouds are, are, are really have some light to it and even the branches of the tree. Now as I move the structure, let's zoom in here a little bit so you guys can see what's going on here. You can see as I move this structure slider, it's going to create a really, really sharp looking scene. I'm not sure if you guys saw that or not. Let's see if I can zoom in. Oops, zoom in a little further here. So you can see that the, the, the leaves are looking almost over sharpened. So you have to be really, there we go. You have to be very careful with using this structure slider and not to overdo it. The punch is actually a really nice way. Uh, personal preference, you might want to go to the classic method and it's going to be uh, a little bit of a softer effect. Um, but it creates a, more of a halo-ish look around it. So the punch is a little bit nicer, but you can't, uh, with both of those settings, you can't go way too much. So I usually keep the structure down pretty low. Somewhere around the 20s is good enough. That's already going to give a pretty punchy looking image. Let's even look at the original to see what the difference is. So there's the original. And there's the new, the new black and white. So the last thing you can do, and I personally don't much care for it in this uh, program, is vignetting. Vignetting, uh, vignetting and film grain. You can these are both options that you can find in Lightroom, but I find that vignetting is pretty limited in Capture One. I, I much prefer the ones that, uh, or the setting that's in, that's found in Lightroom that gives you a little bit more flexibility. You do have different shapes. You can do. Um, highlight preservation or color preservation. Um, it's a much better vignetting option. Uh, vignetting is also great for like if we do have an inconsistency in tone in here, um, you might want to just just bump up your vignette a little bit, just darken it up a little bit. Um, it's a nice effect. I, I, I personally like vignette, but I don't necessarily like the vignette function of Capture One. So I, I do use it with a real, real um, light touch or not at all so um, I don't mind that so much but uh, let's just reset that and leave that so there we go um, tweak it a little bit if you need to go back and forth between some of the base settings and uh, and even the high dynamic range um, you can even at this stage go and increase the, the dynamic range to see what happens if you want to have, see the scene more of the scene below you can always crank that up or you can leave it down below but because we have done all these exposure settings ahead of time, if you did want to go do more recovery, um, if you, if you felt, felt that, that there's more that, that can be seen, you can go back to that high dynamic range and, and, and see it. You can, some people might want to put the high dynamic range last, but I, I do like to sort of get an idea of what I'm working with before I actually go and make some adjustments. Um, also, I can go back into saturation. So watch what happens when I move the saturation. Saturation will change. So as you see, my sky went darker. Or if I find the sky was too dark, I can make it a little lighter. So saturation still has a purpose here. And this is actually really handy. Um, so um, if you've done this in Lightroom, if you do your saturation ahead of time and even your 
your white color balance and then you did your black and white conversion, you cannot go back to that setting and change it and see what happens. You kind of have to do it ahead of time and then apply it. But at least within Capture One, you can actually still maintain that saturation setting and it actually does actually create some uh, different effects as you move it back and forth. So it's just, it's personal preference on how you like that. Uh, you can move that slider back and forth uh, however you like. Well, thank you very much for watching this uh, video, and if uh, you like it, uh, please feel free to comment wherever I posted this and, uh, and encourage me to do more. Um, thank you very much.